So welcome everyone. My name is Brian Strinidi and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Manager with the Dutchess Land Conservancy. Thank you for joining us for this fifth webinar in our Earth Matters series. We're very excited for our guest presenter, Joyce Tomaselli. But first, we have to go over the basic information about tonight's webinar, uh, followed by a brief introduction to the DLC, this program, and tonight's presenter. Uh, first, you are muted to ensure that there is no interruption during the presentation. Second, the raise hand function is disabled and all questions can be answered into the Q&A box, uh, which you can submit at any point during the presentation by accessing the, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be addressed when our presenter is finished or answered by our team during the presentation if possible. Uh, third, the chat is disabled for this event. Fourth, fourth, closed captioning is enabled, which you can find at the bottom right hand of your screen and you can turn it on. Uh, and finally, I'm going to hand the mic over to Julie Hart, our education, she just changed her position, I'm drawing a blank on her title, <laughs> education director, uh, uh, who will give us a bit more about the DLC, this webinar series, and our guest presenter, Julie. Thank you, Brian, and good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining us. So as Brian said, I'm Julie Hart, I'm an ecologist and educator here at the Dutchess Land Conservancy. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the DLC, but for anyone who's not, let me just give you a quick overview. Dutchess Land Conservancy is a private nonprofit land conservation organization located in the Hudson Valley of New York State, and we're dedicated to preserving the farms and forests, wetlands and waterways, open spaces and wildlife habitats of Dutchess County. We are an accredited land trust, and since our founding in 1985, we have worked with hundreds of landowners and protected over 44,000 acres of land. We're so excited that you can be here for our first season of Earth Matters, the DLC's new winter webinar series, which happens on the first Wednesday of each month from November through April. This year's webinars consider the question of how we can improve habitat around our homes to support wildlife. Our expert speakers discuss topics related to native and invasive plants and the role they play in the lives of insects, birds, pollinators, and other wildlife. We hope you'll be inspired to learn how we, as stewards of the land, can make choices that will make our own landscapes more ecologically friendly to all the species that call it home. Many thanks to the Molly B. Schaefer Education Fund for sponsoring this event. And I wanna give a special shout out to Lisa Lott Vince, without whose dedication and enthusiasm these programs would not have been possible. So let's get started. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Joyce yeah, Tomaselli from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Dutchess County as our speaker. Joyce is the Community Horticulture Resource Educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Dutchess County and supports local home gardeners by answering questions, identifying plants and providing advice about pests and diseases. I have worked with Joyce for many years and she is always my go-to resource for all things horticultural, especially when there is a newly emerging invasive species in our area. And it may be new to me, but let me tell you what, when I call up Joyce and ask about this brand new thing, she's already heard about it and can reference a lot of studies that are going on and tell me all about its natural history and provide a lot of information. So she is very much on the cutting edge of invasive species management. She is a key leader for regional cooperative extension programs, especially invasive species education. And she trains and leads the master gardener volunteers. Their annual plant sale in May is always an essential stop for all of our local gardeners. I know I go every year. And you'll also find Joyce and the Master Gardeners working on the display gardens at the Farm and Home Center, which is their office, and it's right down the road from the DLC office. Um, they also teach gardening classes at libraries and garden clubs and at community events year round, and especially look for them at the Dutchess County Fair in August, an event not to be missed. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joyce to teach us more about controlling invasive plants and managed landscapes and beyond. Thank you, Julie, very much. Um, this was such a fun request because there's so much information and sometimes so little information when you're trying to get started. So to set the stage, um, I've been very involved in invasive species knowledge and education in the lower Hudson Valley for about 10 years now as part of, the, of a partner with the PRISM, Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. I realize that uh, uh, many of the people here tonight may not be in the lower Hudson Valley. There are New York PRISMs throughout New York, and they tend to be 
um, situated where you've got similar terrain, geology, temperature. So for example, the lower Hudson region um, is the lower Hudson, but it, it cuts Ulster in half because CRISP, which is the Catskills, is where you have some different terrain and therefore you have different um, invasives. So I'm gonna be using a lot of the lower Hudson prism resources and examples, but I'm hoping to help you understand how to approach this, how to use the resources that you need and how then to be confident to move forward. My, my first degree undergraduate was in math. I got, I got a, a master's in computer science and then strategic marketing management. I think a lot about if then else, and I often have too many words on the file, slides and I don't have the photography skills of your previous speakers. So I apologize for that, but I hope that you'll find that we're um, gonna spend a little time um, figuring out how to approach this, what tools we have and how to go forward. Last little story, well, two little stories. I'm hoping, okay, here in the Manhattan Valley, years ago when the Culinary Institute of America was young, it was really cheap to go and inexpensive to have adult classes at night. And you'd see people came in looking for the recipes, but the chefs wanted to touch, teach techniques. And I'm gonna give you some recipes, but I'm gonna focus a lot about techniques and approach. Last little story. Um, when I started at the PRISM, the executive director at that point in, in, had been um, Linda Rolader, Dr. Linda Rolader, who had done her doctorate on hardy kiwi. And hardy kiwi is an emerging invasive species in the Hudson Valley. And it was introduced a lot of times for people as an ornamental. And now sometimes it's being pushed to grow it for fruit, but it escapes. And I kind of rolled my eyes and I said, I've had hardy kiwi on my land for 30 years and it's never escaped. And three years later, a mile down the road, I found hardy kiwi. So we've eradicated it, but never get smug because you never know what it is may have escaped. And that's part of the reason why we're studying invasive species tonight. So here's my agenda. Julie and I had a little bit of fun. What we were considering the five W's, but in a different order. So I'm gonna go over why, where, who, when, and what. And then we're gonna spend some time on some specific examples of spread of, of plants and how they spread. And the point I'm gonna make then is very much, if you know how it grows, then you can figure out how to start working on managing its spread and what control options to use. We're gonna talk about best practices and then how to make a plan. The other thing I'm gonna say when we talk about um, tonight is, I am not gonna be talking a lot about chemical herbicides, pesticides. I think that if you had followed the series, you can understand that there's a lot of reasons why not to use pesticides. There's gonna be one or two times I say that it might be something worth considering, but I'm only going to talk about pesticides a, a little bit. So again, if you've been following these series or if you are wanting to manage land, I think you know by now that invasives are, they can be plants, they can be pests, diseases, animals, um, they're introduced. They thrive better than the things that are native and they cause harm, that's the point. Introduced sometimes in the plant land, they were introduced because in the 1850s, tree of heaven was brought in because it was such a wonderful ornamental tree. Might have even been earlier than that. But when they were brought in, they were brought in because they were bigger flowered, they were more robust, they were, were more beautiful, and they thrived more because they didn't have their natural predecessors, their predators. And they then caused harm because either they choked out the similar natives or they, they um, caused other problems. So we target invasive species because they're introduced, they thrive more than our natives and they cause harm. And when they thrive more than our natives, they're disrupting the natural biodiversity that we depend upon. If you listen to Dr. Talamy, you understood that there are so many, and the other person whose name I've forgotten, forgive me, last month, there are so many insects that are dependent on specific plants. And when those plants can't thrive because invasives are harming them, we have a biodiversity loss. So we're targeting invasive species so we can change that loss. 
in New York State, the Department of Environment Conservation, DEC, came out with some guidelines, I think in 2014. And I believe that they're updating those, the plants that are covered by those guidelines. And you can look for that. I think I've got a picture at the last. But there are two types of plants that are um, 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 described in New York State. There are prohibited plants. They can no longer be sold. If you have prohibited plants, you should remove them. They're causing harm, they're widespread. There's some that are aquatics, and I'm sorry, I should have said this, I'm mostly focusing on terrestrial tonight. I'm not an expert in aquatics. There's some that grow both places. But yellow flag was introduced. It's, it's bigger, it's brighter, it's more beautiful than our native um, iris. I bought some, I put it in my back pond that's in a brick wall, and I still have little seedlings that I have to mow. It never escaped from my pond because it's bricked around. But if you look around marshes here in our area, you will see the yellow flag iris much more frequently than you see the blue one. So these are no longer allowed to be sold and we should remove them. There's aquatics, there's herbaceous, there's vines and trees, et cetera. I just showed a few of them here. There are also regulated plants. These, when they're sold, are heavily labeled by law that they should not be planted anywhere where they can escape into, into non-managed areas. You should not plant them next to a park. You should not plant them by water. You should not, not plant them where they're not managed and therefore they can, they can, they can escape. Um, these sometimes are a little more subtle on why, what do you mean? Why would sweet autumn clematis be regulated? Well, where I live, it's all growing along the road. It has escaped and it is more robust than the native clematis and it causes more harm because it's a, a bigger vine and it can be more of a problem than the native one, which is it pretty much dies back in winter and, and is much more polite. So if you, first you should not buy them unless you really know what it is you're doing and you're gonna manage everything around there. You should remove them if you can. And if you have one or two that are managed, you shouldn't feel guilty. If you've got a barberry in your, in your shrubbery next to your front porch, maybe that's a good excuse to go out shopping and buy a native bush instead and replace it. Um, Norway maples, I was not aware how um, widespread they had become, but if you train your eye in autumn, and when most of the leaves have fallen off, except for oaks here in New York, and all you see are nice bright yellow maple trees, those are all Norway maples. Norway maples thrive in really heavy shade as well as in sun. And so sometimes they're crowding out all the understory um, plants because the seedlings can be so robust and shade everything out. So they form a monoculture. And again, that's something we want to avoid. And finally, miscanthus, wow, that used to be a favorite of ornamental gardens. They kept their seed plumes in winter. They were beautiful in the, in the sunshine. Uh, they were just gorgeous. And once your eye is trained, you can see that they, like many others, have escaped. So these are in New York regulated. And I show you a list, I show you a place later on that you can find all the lists. We also want people to watch for existing and potential invasive plants. We in the lower Hudson are really close to ports and airports and tourist destinations. There's a lot of opportunity for things to be brought into the area or to be spread from other areas. And so the lower Hudson prism has a series of um, tiers. I think all the New York Prisms use these tiers, but within each region, the plants that are defined in the tier could be unique, okay? And we, when we know that something could just be emerging, a tier one or a threat, but it's not locally common, we ask our really experienced hikers, as an example, to watch for that. Because if we can eradicate those before they spread, we've solved a problem, we've avoided a problem. 
What we as land managers probably are going to see is more the widespread species of established species, the tier three and four. But it's worthwhile to be aware that there are these different sets of plants and there's a lot of information on the prism on the page that says species information. When I get into specifics, I'm also going to be using examples from this species information page. Okay, so that was the why and um, where. Focus your efforts. Now, this is my land. It's an aerial view of my land. And it was um, grazed, I think, until the 50s or 60s. And then it was allowed to go back to um, just natural forest. Um, I gotta find my, my clicker here. So back in the backyard, I was traveling a lot at the time and I put in some really nice English garden style um, um, perennial gardens with some brick walls and they're really pretty. And right now my goal there is to maintain that. When I'm weeding, I will pull out anything like garlic mustard. I will watch for um, some vines that I won't, don't want. I will also pull out things that are native that shouldn't grow there. I really don't want wild black native raspberries to grow in my ornamental perennial garden. I might like goldenrod in the meadow, but I don't want it in my perennial garden. So knowing my natives as well as my invasives and how they grow helps me make decisions and know what to watch for in that perennial garden. Over here on the next side, and by the way, this is, this is um, the top is due south. And so this is very sunny and this is, uh, this is yeah, this is north here, that's south. Um, in the last several years, we put in um, big tracker solar panels and we put in a fenced vegetable garden with some raised beds. So I've really disrupted that soil. And what I'm trying my best to do is bush hog around the, um, the solar panels so that I've got grasses, but I'm not letting any shrubbery come in. And I kind of eye what's blooming at the time and I leave the good things go to seed. Um, if I don't, you know, if I don't see any invasives, then I let them go to seed because I'd like that to be a meadow. I just wanna prevent invasive species. Um, within the um, vegetable garden, I've got to be a little bit more careful because sometimes I'm getting seedy, invasive plants, herbaceous plants, and I need to know how to weed those out and, and how to maybe mulch so that I'm not going to have any bare ground that, that seeds could germinate. Um, here, there's a, big old, there's a big old maple tree. This I mow like grass. Um, this I, um, is, is a sort of a, a hedge, um, all trees here, but this is where the septic tank is here and it goes down a really steep hill. And I noticed that I was starting to get um, Phragmites in here. I've got some Bayberry and I have a neighbor and I don't like seeing that neighbor's stuff. So I'm restoring that and I'm planting native shrubbery in here. And someone said to me, well, what shrubbery are you picking? And I said, anything that's on sale at Adams in October because I can tuck in shrubs and I'm starting to get this um, more restored back into native plants that are a little bit taller so I don't have to see the neighbor. Back here behind the barn, it got away from me. And when I was, um, I just, I, it got away from me. We had some storms, it took down an electric fence and I've got a lot of barberry. And what I need to do now is with really aggressive mowing or pulling, I need to eradicate the barberry that's back there and also to start scouting to see if I've got um, um, other vines and things. So there, my goal is eradication. Down here, this is a really steep 800 foot driveway, which thankfully I just finally got paved. Um, down at the bottom here is where there's a little wetland and a little um, seasonal stream. I don't know my wetlands well enough. I don't know how to manage a, an aquatic area. So I'm trying to learn about that. And meanwhile, whenever I have nice weedy natives like Joe Pye, I throw the seed head in there and it takes. And so I'm getting more native plants. And finally, this is pretty dense and this is very steep. And as ash trees are starting to die from emerald ash borer, I really need to monitor this, 
make sure that if some of the big trees come down, it's not making a, 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 a change in lighting where more invasives can come in. So using my property as an example, I try to make the points that you need to understand your land, what it is you're trying to accomplish, and then focus your efforts and set some goals. Do something this summer, do something next year. Um, try not to get overwhelmed. Realize that patience is a virtue and um, that's gonna help you. Who? This is be realistic. So this is Linda McAteer here. These are our demonstration gardens. And when we started learning about invasives, we said, uh oh, we have miscanthus um, planted on both sides of the welcome to Cornell Cooperative Extension. And so this is Linda showing off her muscles, but behind the scenes, there was a volunteer fire guy that I'll be darned, he showed up with his hatchet. I look out the front and I think, what are they doing? They were able to get out that miscanthus, but trained professionals have more experience, better tools, but I've got to stop here. Is this picture of trained professionals? No, this is a picture of people that do landscape maintenance. This is a trained professional in native, excuse me, and in invasive plant management. And if you Google um, landscape invasive management near me, you will find people who know how to manage invasive species. This happens to be a picture from New York State DEC. This happens to be one of the hogweed strike force people who suit up in Tyvek, and if you find um, giant hogweed, you call the hotline, they eradicate it with herbicides that they are trained to use, and they monitor it for five or more years to make sure it doesn't come back. So you may have some goals that are too much for you to accomplish, so be realistic, and when need be, call in a trained professional. When you do this, I had fun that this is, well, we're March now, but you'll see with some of my pictures, you can do this year round. In winter is a really good time to look through a tangle of, of a hedgerow or of an area that you haven't been able to manage and identify, you can identify some of these things in winter. You can identify Barberry, because it still has seeds. You can identify Euonymus because you can see the little wingy thingies on it. Um, you can understand what you have and you can, you can remove it pretty much in winter. You don't want to do it in spring when it's really muddy. You also, in your managed perennial garden, want to look for things like this. This is bittercress. And in my back patio right now, it's almost ready to bloom because that faces south, it's getting warm, and this lurks in the cracks of the bricks until it gets a couple warm days. It sets up a tiny little seed. That seed ripens. It spurts. I think the word is dihesic. dihesic. It spurts when it's um, mature, and then it lurks until next October, November, and it sits there to grow. So watch for winter weeds and get rid of them. In spring is when you can really start looking for seedlings of vines, seedlings of trees. A lot of the invasives, specifically the Lanicera honeysuckle, um, specifically the barberry, they bloom out earlier than our natives. You can see that, excuse me, they leaf out. They leaf out earlier. When you see a lot of stuff that's leafing out, go look at it. Maybe mark it with an orange tape and start watching it. I'm not very good on my white flowers in May. These, this is a viburnum. I have to keep going back to my, to my records, to my books, to figure out which is native and which is not. But start walking your land and seeing what you've got and use a green tie when you figured out it's a good thing. Use a red tie when it's a bad thing. You can reuse the ties. And then you can start understanding when you might um, be able to do something um, pr uh, productively. You also want to monitor where you pull things out to see if you've got anything new that's regrowing. Spring to fall, anything that's out there you can identify with leaves. 
You can probably use mowing. You really want to understand when the plant is going into seed so that you can manage it before the seeds form or before the seeds ripen. In late summer, I'm going to talk about something called a cut stump method in details in just a minute. And in autumn is a really good time to go shopping. Like I said, lurk around your favorite garden store and find the things that are for sale or spend more money in spring or order it online. But it's a really good time to plant um, shrubs, trees, because even though it starts getting colder in October and November, the ground does not freeze, it does not get cold, the roots still have time to um, grow and get nutrition and go dormant nicely, such that they're a little bit more established than if you plant something in spring. So autumn is a really good time to plant. So that was the who, what, when, where, and why in whatever order I said it was gonna be in. Let's talk about a couple of things now before I get into more details. Integrated pet pest management is a approach which is taught by most responsible gardeners, certainly the extension system, where pests, which could be plants or diseases or bugs or whatever, is, is it's, you, you want to manage your problems using safe methods. We, we really, I think, are beyond the years where what's wrong with this? I don't know, grab something and spray it and it'll be dead. What integrated pest management in, um, um, emphasizes is that you, could, you should understand the range of options that are available for managing that specific pest and manage it at a way that you can accept the results. I mean, this happens a lot with bugs. If you've got two flies in your house, you're not going to bomb everything, right? But with plants, if there's a couple of trees that you would rather have been native, but it's not one that's sold anymore, but that tree is not causing a problem, then, then leave it. So understand whether it's a level that's acceptable. The next thing is you want to prevent, you want to monitor and take action if that's necessary. And finally, as I said originally, use the least harmful method first and use the least toxic pesticide as a last result. So let's talk pesticides. This is all I'm going to say. Well, there's two other places I talk about pesticides. An herbicide, a fungicide, and a caricide, all of those are pesticides. Anything that's used to control a pest is a pesticide. And I have a cat who's banging at the door and excuse me a moment to get the cat to go away. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're all doing this from home. And the cat was banging on the pocket door. Um, when we talk about any pesticide, the law, the federal law and the New York or in your state enforced law is every pesticide label has to include all these things you see here. It's gonna tell you how to use it. It's gonna tell you whether you're gonna mix it. It's gonna tell you whether you use it as is out of the bottle. It's gonna tell you how long you need to stay away from that before a room if you use it indoors. It's gonna tell you how long you should not eat that vegetable after you used something. All of this information must be on every label. It may be tiny font, you may need to peel it off and get out your magnifying glass, but it's going to be there. It's gonna tell you whether it's hazardous to children, whether it's hazardous to animals. It's gonna say who made it, and it's gonna say what is in there. And it's always gonna say, what is this labeled to control? And it's always gonna say active ingredients. There's branding that's gotten really strange these days. Oops, that's the clock, I'm sorry. Oh, it was only half. You're gonna to have to mute me in a half an hour, Brian. <laughs> sorry. Um, um, Roundup is a label that now is a brand that is also producing products that are used, for example, on lawns. Roundup does not necessarily mean glyphosate anymore. Glyphosate is the active ingredient Roundup is the brand. Um, there are other systemic herbicides that are typically available for homeowners to use. 
What I want you to do is if you get to a point where you think you must use an herbicide, you need to identify the plant that you're gonna use it on. You need to contact the manufacturer or go to a good store and read the label and find out what the active ingredient is, how dangerous it might be, and in fact, can it be used for that plant? Always read and follow label directions. The label is the law. In integrated pest management, what we're gonna find is I'm gonna talk mostly about mechanical and physical or cultural. The um, toxicity goes up as you go up this classic triangle up to chemical. And we're better off preventing with cultural and mechanical methods and with less cost and risk. So primarily we're going to use those bottom bits when we talk about terrestrial invasive plants. And I'm gonna spend the next half hour trying to help us all understand if you can identify the plant and its growth characteristics. If you know the plant's life cycle, annual, biannual, perennial, then choose the best control options. And you're also gonna understand the timing when. All right, so I'm for the next few minutes gonna go through the following options. Cutting, digging, hand pulling. Depending upon the size of the plant you're going after, depending upon, <laughs> I like this hatchet. <laughs> I don't have a hatchet that big. I've got a loppers that big. And this one's really nice because it has a lightweight handle. I have an older one that has a metal handle and I get tired trying to lop over my head because it's so heavy. So consider the tools that you have and what you're applying them to in terms of cutting, in terms of digging, um, similarly, you might have a hand trowel, you might have a, 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 a pitchfork, a garden, a garden fork, excuse me. Um, you might have an iron rake. This is really good for things like um, the Japanese stiltgrass. You need to know how deep that plant's roots are, and you need to know how much of that plant's roots you need to get out. And I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of rhizomes and other things. You can hand pull seedlings. Gosh, as soon as you have, have nice um, weather, you can go out and start looking for seedlings and vines, et cetera. These tools, which used to be pretty popular, especially in ornamental gardens, you think of them in beautifully tended English gardens or, or the gardens that are, that are um, 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 displayed on, on you know, wonderful books, you've got to make sure that what you're not doing is exposing seeds because scuffing around a lot of dirt to get out these little weeds might just let the next seeds get more light and air and water and cause them to sprout. So if you leave bare soil, make sure that you monitor it really closely or mulch it so that you're not providing a place that then um, the, the new set of seeds can germinate. <clears throat> Always keep your tools clean and sharp so that you're not fighting the tool. You're just using a really sharp tool on the plant. And always clean your tools on site after you use them so that you're not spreading seeds or roots to your other garden or to another place. What did someone say to me the other day? They moved, they, they, they rearranged a garden that had mugwort and they were so careful to get all the dirt off all of the, all the soil, excuse me, all the soil off the ornamental plants and they moved them and they had mugwort again. Well, mugwort isn't soil, mugwort is roots. So they washed the roots, but they still had mugwort roots. So they have now have mugwort in their other garden. When you get into bigger things, there's pulling and grubbing um, um, uh, tools. And everyone loves something called weed wrenches. You talk to the uh, professionals and you can see that it's heavy duty. It gives you a lot of leverage. Um, there's several different names. I think Polar Bear now is being made by somebody else um, who used to be part of the company and now makes it similarly. But if you look up weed wrenches, these are really good for plants that don't have super deep roots. You can pull them out 
you make sure you get the whole crown of the plant and pull it out as much as you can. And what many say is because the seeds aren't all that viable, you can actually leave the plant there to sort of um, 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 keep new seedlings from, from sprouting. So weed wrenches are really good for some of the bigger things. This is the next place I was gonna talk about a systemic herbicide. When you've got what we call woodies, this is um, actually, this is, a, this is a native, that's poison ivy, but it's a vine that is, can be controlled with this method. And this is a tree, I don't know which tree it is. The point is, when you freshly cut a woody plant, a tree or a vine, you then spray it with a systemic herbicide. And you do this in autumn when the plant is bringing nutrients from its leaves to its roots prior to going dormant. Because that's when it's gonna be bringing that systemic herbicide through the cambium layer here, through the xylem and phloem, and it's going to bring the systemic herbicide down to the roots of that plant and kill that plant's roots. This shows a spray. I like to use a cheap um, sponge brush from the local hardware store, and it's a trick to put pool dye or other dye in it so you can see where you've been. You want to do this as soon after you've done the cut as possible. And it's awfully nice to work with a buddy where one person cuts and the other person sprays. In some cases like woody vines, poison ivy is native, but it can be a nuisance. Wisteria is not deemed to be invasive, but it can be an unwanted plant in your garden. It's really hard to kill them without doing it this way. You can just cut them, but you need to monitor for the next several years because the roots are still very strong. It took them many years to build that big of a vine. And if you just cut it, you need to monitor and keep getting rid of all of the new, seed, the new sprouts. So the cut stump method is best done in fall, excuse me, late summer through early fall, and it needs to be done with care, and it can be appropriate on a couple of things. I'm going to talk more about Tree of Heaven in a minute. Autumn Olive, I don't think I talk about specifically. That is one of the shrubs that when you cut it, you stimulate new stem growth. Other things that are available is girdling, and girdling might be done for a large tree, for a nuisance tree, for one that's in the forest that you don't want to go in there and actually take it out. But what you're doing is you're cutting it deeply enough that you're going past, you're interrupting that cambrium layer so water and nutrients can't go up or down. And eventually that in a few years or less, that tree will die. Um, you could leave it in the woods where it is, or you could, you could manage taking it out. Um, so it's an option, again, that can be done calorie, a uh, Bradford pear, Norway maple, this might be something you want to do if you found it in a, in a wooded area that you're trying to manage. Another cool girdling approach is for Japanese knotweed. And this came out of England, the UK, and this is um, very nicely described if you look this up with Vermont invasives. And basically what you do is you take hardware cloth that has half inch spacing and you um, secure it down on the area where Japanese knotweed has been. Maybe you mowed this or maybe it's early spring. And as it grows, each time each stem gets bigger than the half inch wire, it girdles itself. And it eventually starves the roots so that they can no longer keep re-sprouting. It does take some time. And there's a fun story from a colleague. He was managing a trail and he put some of this down and within a week it was gone. And he got fussed and he put it down. And another week later it was gone. And we finally said, Walter, do you think someone thinks it's trash? Put out a sign. 
and he put it down and he put out a sign and he said, this is an experiment. We are killing Japanese, not weed. And whoever it was stopped cleaning it up. And it's been really interesting and it's proving effective. So that's another way that you can girdle. This is Japanese, not weed, and I'll bet it works for bamboo also. Root barriers, when you have plants that spread by rhizome, this is bamboo, uh, rhizome and stolen, um, there are nuances uh, when you're a botanist, but basically it says that any piece of any of this root or stem that is left in the ground is going to sprout new plants. So root barriers, are used when you basically circle an area where this invasive plant has become successful. You dig deeper than those roots normally go. You put a barrier so that when they hit that barrier, they come back up. And now you're able to stop them from going further. You're able to continue to cut and control them and you eventually starve and also keep them from um, spreading. This is an example. The DEC says when you dig Japanese knotweed, you should bury it six feet deep with, um, with uh, plastic around it to, to truly dispose of it. So root barriers are something that I had not thought about before, but if you really have to get serious about something like bamboo, that's an option. Smothering is also an option. Um, this is what's called weed cloth. It is generally plastic and woven. It will disintegrate after several years. You can reuse it. And basically you're not allowing the plants to photosynthesize. So it cannot, um, it cannot feed its roots. And so it will kill everything under there, but then you can reestablish the plants that you want. Grazing, I had to have a little bit of fun here. There's you, this is, this is some palace, maybe it's Buckingham, I don't know. These are sheep. Grazing is an option. Now we have goats that can be used to graze some invasives. They are controlled in an area and they're very good at eating the invasives to the point where they can no longer survive. Mowing is an option for those in the lower Hudson Valley. Did anyone know that Newburgh was the center of lawnmower manufacturing worldwide for some time? Um, there were mowers that were pushed, that were horses, that were, look at the chain, look at the, 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 the engine on this one. And this is fun. This is from a friend who's third generation um, golf course manager. And he remembers this 1950s Toro golf course mower and said it was so heavy, no way could a person that size manage that lawn mower. It was a three reel electric or a engine mower. I have a new Kubota, which is my best, best friend now when I want to mow carefully in the field or, or um, places that I need to get in close. And this is an example of a robot mower that can be used these days. So mowing is really good, especially for some of the herbaceous plants. Finally, in terms of control, always think about safe disposal. If it spreads by seed and rhizome, please don't throw it in your compost pile, right? You're always best to pull things before the seeds form. You can form brush piles, and, and they're just gonna, they're just gonna get, get dead. If they're just gonna die, they're just gonna dry out. If you want to um, let something air dry and you don't want something to drag it away, maybe you wanna cover it, but basically you want them to really dry out. Um, small non-woody plants, you can, you can bake, you can put in, in the trash, never put it in your compost pile because we normally don't get it uh, hot enough to um, kill the seeds. Um, chip large woody plants. I wrote when the fruit or seeds are not present, but also you never want to chip rhizomous plants and then use those chips because there still could be roots or pieces of the um, plant that can now reproduce. So make sure whenever you're getting rid of things that you, um, you know how they grew. So I went over why and where and who and when and what. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some specifics and we're going to apply these sets of advice to some specific things. So first we have to identify plants and know how they spread. And then we're going to talk about some best practices. So 
I'm going to show you, I'm going to mention three ways to identify invasives. We teach our master gardener volunteers, we teach the invasive strike force volunteers. You may really want to understand the botanical characteristics that are important when invasives are being identified. The branching. Most trees are alternate. There's only a few that are opposite. Many shrubs are both opposite and alternate. The leaf arrangement, whether it's simple, the petiole bud is here, compound, multiple leaflets, the petiole bud is here, doubly compound, leaflets on leaflets, uh, the bud's here, that's like, um, um, oh, I forgot its name, oh, Kentucky coffee tree. The leaf margin, whether it's entire, whether it's serrated, um, the whole shape of the leaf, there's all sorts of things that you can use, especially in summer. Bark can be winter, bud scars can be winter, and you can do a lot of things that are science-based. You can have books, you can have all sorts of things. You get good at it. It's worth the investment. Also in the last couple of years, there's some really powerful tools that have been commonly made available. 10 years ago, Leaf Snap, a few others, eh, not so good. There are, there are image recognition technology now that is really, really good. Don't tell the people that send me pictures of bugs for me to identify, because lately I can point my smartphone at it and I can get it within a, within a really short time. Um, Seek is a smartphone free application. Behind it is National Geographic, iNaturalist. The amount of material that it can identify is incredible. The way that kids can get involved is cool. There's games, there's sharing. Um, basically, technology. Uh, I was walking with a friend, a colleague at a state park. We were planning a invasives walk for Earth Day. We came up over a hill and some rocks and I said, what is that? And it's, it's March because we're planning for April. And I look at it and I'm thinking and I'm looking around. She takes out her phone and says, butternut. And she was right. It was a grove of butternut trees that are probably original on the side of the Hudson River in an area where there's never been any building. I went back in spring and checked out their leaves and it was butternut. And it would have taken me a long time to figure that out compared to, um, compared to black walnut and others. So seek, it's cool if you haven't looked at it. And then it also um, keys into something called iNaturalist, which does a lot of mapping. And this is what a lot of the scientists are using these days in our region. And finally, what I'm going to use for the next couple of minutes, uh, maybe 15, 20, is the Lower Hudson Prism has taken the materials that are especially relevant to the plants that are of a special concern and prevalency in the Hudson Valley, and they've made descriptions for each one where each plant it gives the description, it gives photos. How did it get here? Did it come here through packing material? Um, did it come here, you know, whatever. It's interesting, I think it's interesting. Talks about where the plant thrives. Does it need moist? Does it need shade? Does it need wet? Um, maybe if you've got a persistent problem with one plant and you make it less wet in that area, you'll help get rid of that invasive. It talks about how and when it reproduces what harm it does, and then it gives a whole, list, a whole list of methods and whether they're appropriate or not. I did not include controlled burn because I think most of us should not be out there in our, in, our play, in our areas controlled burning, but it emphasizes to what goals you might want to set. So the lower Hudson prism, again, at the species information is what I chose to use to give you examples tonight, but there are many things um, talk to experts in your area, see what's most comfortable for you, um, and, and start becoming familiar and, and using it. And I think you're going to get really experienced 
um, in understanding your land and how to manage it. And that's research. So we have science, we have technology, and we have research are the resources that we can use um, to, to apply to our own home. Okay, what I like to do is I like to start with trees. And I, in my mind, I'm very visual, but I get distracted easily. So for me, I wanna look at the trees around me. What do I see? What attributes am I looking for in, in this time of year? And I think about the trees and in what I'm looking for. Trees, most of them in our region, spread by seed. So the cat managed to get in. If it jumps on the table, I'm sorry, but it opened the door. Now we have two cats, sorry. Primarily by seed, if you cut a tree down, scout for seedlings, the seeds usually last a few years, not horribly long. Um, some of them can spread by root sprouting. Um, Japanese angelica tree is fairly unusual in our area. It was introduced, it has escaped, and it has wicked, wicked, wicked thorns. So when it escapes in a natural area, the deer don't need it. Nothing bothers it because it has those thorns. And it forms colonies. And even if you find a couple, it root sprouts. So that's one of those that professionals really need to know what it is they're doing and when to try and deal with some of these. We've had them in some of the parks where it's very rocky and hard to get to it. Um, the maples are pretty much seeds. These are pretty much seeds. Um, there's a Amir cork tree. I don't, there is a local college that has a tradition of planting special trees for each graduating class. And one year the graduating class um, planted Amir cork and now there's a whole grove of it where there isn't supposed to be. There's also some of these on Cornell campus. But trees are pretty easy. If you're removing big trees, you do want to monitor um, what's going to be, be growing there because the sunlight now is going to be changed and you might want to replace the understory. This is a specific that I'm going to go through, Acer planetoides, Norway maple. This is all summarized from that prism um, um, page. It spreads by seeds. Um, you can cut or girdle it. You can cut in and and cover cut or cover small trees that will kill them because they don't have any light. Um, you know, put a put a tarp down and put a brick on top of it, and that'll kill it. Um, make sure that if you cut something that I just said, um, you really want to limit the seed production, and you want to prevent saplings from going to grow too big. And if you disturb the soil, you're going to have a lot more seed germinating. So that's just a short in example from the, from the species information. Okay, here's a quiz. It's not a quiz. I didn't have time to make polls. If you look at these two trees, I took these photos last weekend. They are giving me clues of their identification in winter. If you know what they are, good. This is the seed close up of that one that might help you know what it is. The one on that side that would be left is American Beach and the one on the right is Tree of Heaven. They're unique in that in our area, they're the only true trees, they're the only two trees-ish that have smooth bark when they're mature. I guess sycamore is smooth, but it's not smooth gray. Um, not many others have smooth bark. A lot of young trees have smooth bark, but if you see a big tree and it has smooth bark, you're gonna look closer to see if it's beech or tree of heaven, right? And when you see the mature tree, you're also gonna step back and you're gonna say, do I see similar trees near this one? because both of these trees root sprout and form colonies. When baby beech trees, when beech trees are young, their leaves persist. It's thought that maybe it keeps deer from browsing, but so if you see a big tree and then lots of little ones nearby mm -hmm. with the leaves still on them the 1st of March, it's a beech. 
okay? Um, the tree of heaven has a lot of, um, has really big seed heads, big, big flower heads. And then for the females, that seed head will persist, okay? I want you to think about these or even go out and scout in winter because beach a native in our lower Hudson, in Ohio, around Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and maybe Long Island, Connecticut, is suffering some, from something called beech leaf disease. And Tree of Heaven, the invasive, is a favorite source of sap for spotted, spotted lanternfly, which is moving into our area from Pennsylvania and New Jersey. These are close-ups of them. Beach leaf disease has just been determined, verified to be spread by nematodes. It makes this very strange stippling on the leaves. It also infects next year's buds. And in a few years, three to five to six to seven, mature trees can be killed because the buds can't grow and they can't photosynthesize. So if you see American beech, make a note of it later in the year to look and see if you see anything that looks like this. And if you see mature tree of heaven, mark where there's little ones, because in June, July, August, you're gonna to want to look at those young ones for spotted lanternfly. This is an example of a root sprouted growth of Ilanthus tree of heaven. This is the original adult, this looks like it got mowed. It's probably a, tr a, a, a road here. It might be a, a railroad, it's too steep, but something mowed this and all of these sprouted up. Where I live, I can see along the road where a couple of mature ones were cut down and now it's just, it's just lined with 20 foot tall um, roots sprouting. And that's why for Tree of Heaven, the, um, approach to manage it is through the cut stump method. And I think at the end, I say that there's a really good article from Penn State um, University on that. After I've looked at the trees, I like to look at vines. And this time of year is a really good way to look, a really good time to look at vines and identify them by their winter appearance. And then knowing what the vine is, you can make a plan for when you would want to manage it. You would, come, you would cut stump the woody ones like bittersweet, like kudzu, like porcelain berry in autumn. Some are mostly by, spread by seed and you wanna look for seedlings in spring, but some are sneaky. That is not a botanical term. It's all I could think of when I was typing this. Some are sneaky. Let's look at the woodies. These three natives sometimes can be a nuisance if they're in your perennial garden, if they're climbing on your favorite ornamental or native dogwood tree. But even in winter, you can identify Virginia creeper. It has very plain stems, a little bit of lenticle spots there, but it has really cool tendrils. And it's very polite. It drapes on a tree. And as the tree grows, it just stays draped. It's not going around. It's not grasping the, 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 the boughs. It's very polite. Our native fox grape also has tendrils. The tendrils are a little more robust, but also it has this really distinct vertical shred um, to its bark. So you can see this in winter. And you might say, I don't want that grape growing there. And you might mark it to use the cut stump method in fall, in, in late summer to fall. Poison ivy, same thing. These little aerial rootlets um, cl climb and grow and work their way into the bark and then grow with a tree. The Chinese bittersweet, there is a native 
bittersweet. And when the professionals I was meeting said, I've never seen it. Can you mute me, Brian? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, there is a there is a native bittersweet, and everyone says they've never seen a native bittersweet in New York. And sadly, I haven't either. And you can tell them apart. I did find one out at my brother's house on Lake Michigan, where there's not been much building, and it was in the woods. And I think it was a native bittersweet. But what you're going to see is you're going to see craggier um, vines, but they but they girdle. And every year they get bigger and bigger and every year they girdle the object or tree or shrub upon which they're growing, they girdle it more and they eventually kill it. When you've identified woody vines and decided when to deal with them, do realize that you can accomplish what you need by cutting it or managing it at the ground. What professionals like to do is they like to make a gap so that when they're walking through, they can see that they have cut that. You don't have to pull it out of, the, out of what it's growing on. You don't have to pull it out of the trees. You may do more damage by trying to pull it out. You will let that die, you let that be there, but you're gonna monitor the roots and make sure that it's not re-sprouting. Those are woody vines. Here's two sneaky vines. Oops, I gotta click here, I think. Anyone know what this is? It's, a, it's not a great photo. I told you I didn't have good, good photography as your previous speakers. It's sort of grassy-like. It's sort of just really fine, a blanket that's draped over shrubs and on tree limbs. This is, this is on my road. Um, that's, oh, five, six, seven feet tall off the side of the road. You might recognize it when I show you what it looks like in summer. That's mile a minute vine. So you can see that this time of year and you can know when to scout. Mile a minute vine spreads by seed. The birds eat it and it can, bound, it can float down water. The seeds ripen in, depending on the year, September, October. We had a cold summer a couple of years ago and they didn't ripen until later. They're very blue, they're beautiful. They're very blue once they ripen. There is a weevil that has been introduced some places and is now successfully keeping some populations under control because it eats the leaves and, and it damages it and it can't thrive. You can pull it by hand for a good part of the year. It grows very quickly and it has really wicked, wicked um, spines. So you wanna wear gloves or you can use a metal rake and just pull it out from where it's growing. You can repeatedly mow it if it's, if it's in just grass, but usually it's climbing on something. You wanna watch for a few years for seedlings, and it may be that if you clear an area and then mulch it, that's gonna be good. I found this, I told you it was on my road. Um, my road, it's the road that I walk every day with my dogs, and so I see all these things. And it was four years ago that I saw, oh my goodness, I see mile a minute. And I talked to the landowners, and they didn't do anything for two years until it got really nasty. And last year, they really pulled out a hedgerow. They cleaned it all out. They established grass. They're mowing it, and they're going to be able to monitor it. Sadly, the seeds moved across the road, and now it's in the next neighbor's woods, and I have to talk to him. But this is one of the sneaky growers, and you can see it easily, and you can manage it, especially if you do it when it's early. If you ever have any seeds on the... On the uh, debris that you bring out, make sure you bag it and throw it away as solar as it. The other sneaky one is this one. Anyone recognize this one? This one's harder to, to see. Um, this is kind of indicative where it's sort of the milkweed pod. And this is really obvious once you see it growing. And these flowers are not very obvious. And it's something called um, black swallow wart. And we in the Hudson Valley also are, are, um, are, have a dubious distinction of being an area which has a population of pale swallowwort, which is a little less um, common. 
but it's a member of the milkweed family and it twines up. So this is outside our office. Yes, I have a wonderful invasive center office. And that's on a woody um, shrub that's about six feet tall. And so it looks like it's an annual, it, it will regrow from the ground. So it's, it's sort of a, a, a smaller vine. Goes six to seven feet. Seeds are viable four to five years. And the problem is, is both the root crown and any rhizome, any underground root um, can sprout new plants. And the sad thing is, is caterpillars, monarchs and others that are attracted to this because it's of the milkweed family, the caterpillars which feed on these vines die. Um, it's not a native, it's introduced and it's toxic to our native caterpillars which feed on milkweed. There is a moth that's under study, and there are herbicides that have been studied. In fact, they were studied on the land just close to us. And so there may be some herbicides that are available soon for this. But basically, you got to watch for it. And if you dig it, you really have to get everything you can. Um, usually pesticides are required, and it's not good. It's not a good candidate for grazing. So those are the two sneaky vines that I wanted to tell you about to watch for if you're managing your landscape. Next, I like to look at shrubs. And the shrubs usually spread by seed. I told you that they often um, um, leaf out sooner. You can mow repeatedly. You can pull them out with a chain, with your tractor. Always scout for regrowth. Shop and, and replace them. Um, the shrubs are... are, 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 are Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, here's Japanese barberry. The roots are shallow but tough, so I use the bucket of my tractor to, to push it out. You can use that reed, weed wrench, um, cut or mow. Some people say they like to mow it with a bush hog in September, and it grows enough that it feeds the deer, and the, and the deer eat it down, and then you mow it again in spring, and that can, can that repeated abuse can, can keep it from um, thriving. Um, you really want to monitor because the seeds can live for quite some time, and it's always fun to go shopping. This is wineberry. I had no idea the seeds were viable for 100 years. It looks like our native black raspberry. Um, the, 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 the berries are delicious. Um, it likes to be where there's any disturbed land. Um, if you want to go find it, go down to the Beacon train station. It's all the way around. Um, but it is something that needs to be managed because it's taking over along the sides of the roads and causing a big problem with that. Um, Scotch broom, I wanted to include. It's um, just emerging in the Hudson Valley. It's especially in the lower Hudson. This was something that was the, uh, adored by a lot of people who liked um, European um, perennial ornamental gardens, and it's escaping. Um, it has to be pulled. You, you want to um, monitor, and if you're interested, go to the lower Hudson prism or Google prism detective dogs, because there are two dogs, Fagan and Dia, who have been trained to scout areas that have been um, found to have scotch broom. And after the crews have taken out the scotch broom, Dia and Fagan by their nose can go find the seedlings and point out anything that was missed. It's way cool. Herbaceous plants are usually more spreading by seed, but some of them can be especially pernicious because they spread by rhizome. Our native wildflowers, in the woodier ones don't. I mean, if you cut down a goldenrod, it's not going to be able to, to, re, to regrow. It might, it might have roots that grow for next year. But mowing is often something that can be used, especially in a meadow or especially in a border area, to deal with some of our herbaceous perennials. Some of them are sneakier than that. Um, but I've seen, I've, I, there's, a, there's a pasture that the horses, I don't know where they went, and no one mowed the pasture, and now it's nothing but spotted knapweed. It's a shame. Um, along the road, the wild chervil, when, when it's mowed, it spreads by seed, and if they mow the wrong time, now it's just billowing with wild chervil all along the roads. Um, 
I wanted to talk about one of these. Anyone know what this is? It's not a great photo. It's me with my smartphone. This is what it looks like in spring. This is an especially evil weed called mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris. And it once it's established, it's really hard to get rid of. Um, the seeds are viable for many years. It has thousands of seeds and any of the rhizomes that are not pulled out can re-sprout. So we had some growing in at our demo gardens where the mulch was dumped and we've been repeatedly mowing it. And now I have some smothering, I have some cloth down to smother it. And hopefully we will have gotten rid of the mugwort, but it took, it took a couple of years to, to do that. So if you see it, get rid of it. Canada thistle, I picked this one because it's one of the ones that's a perennial herb. It has a herbaceous plant. Um, it has a very deep tap root. And unless you're good with a garden fork or you wait until the soil is really moist, every time you pull one out, you get this much tap root and you leave that much tap root. So it spreads by both seed and rhizome and you have to be very persistent. Now, one of the reasons that this is a favorite uh, several years ago, we were leaving for two weeks in August on vacation, and I came home a couple of nights before and thought, oh no, because in the shrubby area, I saw all sorts of Canada thistle. So instead of packing for the vacation, I went out and I pulled all the thistle, and it was just starting to bud, and I pulled all the thistle, and I put it in the garden way, and I parked the garden way behind the barn, and we went on vacation, and I came home, and two weeks later, there had been enough rain and enough energy in those plants that they all bloomed, and they all went to seed, and kind of the thistle seeds were floating all across my meadow. Always dispose of things appropriate, and now I've mowed for years, and there's no more Canada thistle, but it's an example of a perennial herb with a really deep tap root. And I'm almost done here, I think, is um, there are other things that seem to be so innocent. Bishop Scout weed, it's something that tolerates very heavy shade and it spreads by rhizomes, stolons. And I know of a place on the side of the Taconic now where I see a whole drift of Bishop Scout weed that escaped from someone's garden and it's now taking over under the edge of the woods there. So don't plant these things. Keep an eye out for what is emerging in our area, um, what's established. If you, if you um, need to manage it out of your woods or out of your perennial gardens, don't buy it, don't plant it, and, and find something else. Lastly, particularly annoying weeds, giant hogweed. I told you before that if you see giant hogweed, you call the DEC in New York, and they have people that come out and take care of it for you. It's enormous, it's toxic in that if the sap gets on your skin and sun gets on the sap, you have a physical burn and that is um, of, of, of particular huh, harm. Um, bamboo, we talked a little bit about the fact that you can use root barriers, you could maybe girdle, you really do need to mow repeatedly and really scout to make sure that they're not spreading um, beyond where you are watching. Um, they can go under structures, they can go under uh, fences, they can go to your neighbor's yard and cause unhappiness. The perennial gardens that we're so happy about, the, the ornamental, the Chinese silvergrass miscanthus, um, phragmites are some that can be very deeply rooted and very hard to eradicate. This is phragmites. It's usually in dense stands in wetlands. And I knew that but when I typed it, I realized that just gave me a clue because that area where I not, don't wanna see my neighbor and I'm starting to put in some shrubs and it's on the edge of the septic drain field is where I have a few stems of Phragmites. And I'll bet you that if I really go after them now and keep watching and mowing, they're only there because it's moist there. And I'll bet you I can keep them from spreading any further down the hill and down the stream by really scouting. So you can dig, you can cut. The, 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 um, the prism entry for this is very long. There's a lot of options, but Phragmites is really hard to control. It may be that you want to consult a professional because if you're modifying water levels or you're doing something proactively, you may be bothering the wildlife that's taking shelter like the red-winged blackbirds and other things that love the wetlands.
Okay, last one, I think this is not a great photo. You probably recognize it more. This is Japanese silk grass and it is an annual grass. It spreads by seed. The seed is only viable for five years. So if you go after it as soon as you see it, you're gonna be able to cut that cycle. I never knew why it was named stilt grass until I wrote this presentation. As it grows, if it gets tall, its, its elbows go down and those stilts can <laughs> form roots. So that's why it's called stilt grass. Now, it's really easy to pull from your managed ornamental perennial gardens. It's easy to pull from the side of your lawn. The problem is, is that if you get it in your lawn, or if you mow with your mower on the edges and then mowing your lawn. Repeated mowing doesn't make it stop set seed. It just lets it set seed shorter and shorter. So no, I think it's middle August around here, maybe a little earlier. You really wanna deal with Japanese silk grass before it goes to seed. And where I did get nice uh, swaths of it in my lawn, I've been overseeding with perennial rye in autumn and it's choking out the silk grass. So make a plan. I've told you how to use techniques, how to use tools. Walk your land, walk your garden, walk your road, talk to your neighbors. Realize what you have that should be removed because it's invasive. You might want to remove some misbehaved non-native plants like wisteria. It's not labeled as invasive, but it can be misbehaved. You might want to take away things like poison ivy because you'd rather not get rashes. And you might realize that there was a good plant and it's just not growing where it should be and you should put something there more suitable. And that's a good time to learn more about native plants. Um, you can use well-behaved non-native plants that help add diversity for pollinators and for your landscape. It's easy to go shopping for perennials and grasses, but think about establishing trees and shrubs and knowing where you've got the space for them and where you can give something that's going to be a benefit for generations. So focus your efforts, get to work, figure out what it is you want to do, target your areas, make notes, don't get overwhelmed. Set your goals, whether you wanna remove things, whether you wanna prevent it, whether you want to have an area that, I've got, I've got an area along the edge I didn't point out that I just mow every other year because I like the milkweed and I like the, the wildflowers in there and I've got some trillium established and I'm not gonna fuss so much if I've got something that is an invasive herbaceous perennial, I'm just gonna let it all grow. When you remove, you wanna restore, if you, if you left an open area, and when you remove, you wanna monitor. Choose your weapons, don't get overwhelmed. And just for fun, I was telling Julie and Brian when we started, this is not a native, it is not an invaded, invasive. It is introduced Winster aconite. It was blooming in my perennial garden on the south side by the house three or four days ago, and yes, there were honeybees on it. So that's what I came to talk to you about tonight. I'll be available for, for questions for a little while. I, um, this is recorded, so Julie will be able to share this with you. I created resources, and my last point is you can get overwhelmed. You can search and find so much information that I suggest that you find resources whose goal is to educate people about invasive plants. In New York, it's our prisms. Um, if your prism isn't really active, look at the Lower Hudson prism, lots of great stuff. iNaturalist um, has the information on seek as well as the other things they have. Here's the tree of heaven, how to um, remove it uh, successfully. There's the knotweed. Um, DEC has the invasive species, a lot of re resources. And if you want to know more about what plants are invasive in New York, you look up this title. And oh, I was right, it's 2014, and I think it's being updated. Um, oops, am I going the wrong way? I'm going the wrong way. I am finished. And so I go to whoever is taking over next. 
Wow, thank you, Joyce. That was incredible. So much information. I bet I am not the only one whose to-do list has just been reorganized slightly. And at the top of my list is going to be following your good example and getting rid of that miscanthus that grows in front of my house. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, in a second, we'll go into the Q&A. But before that, I just wanted to remind everyone that we will be sending out a follow-up email um, with a list of the resources that Joyce has named here and also a link to the recording of tonight's video. And I just want to remind everyone that our next webinar is on Wednesday, April 6th, and Margaret Roach is going to be speaking about nonstop plants, a garden for 365 days. And that will wrap up our webinar series for the season. So let's go ahead and get into the Q&A. So the first question is from someone asking for tips on how to deal with homeowner associations. Um, they say in their neighborhood, open spaces, there's Japanese silk grass, not weed and barberry. It feels like a losing battle and there doesn't seem to be any interest in spending money on managing those plants. I've had calls from organizations like that and um, I've offered, I've not been taken up on it, but I think, I think coming to a mutual understanding of the mutual benefit that if, if, if the association can understand that this is causing harm and replacing it thoughtfully with something that's gonna be easier to maintain and gonna be more beneficial, if you can get the sense that, that you're in it together, the maintenance people might not be understanding or want to understand until they know that they can have something that's more beautiful, that's easier to maintain. So I think it has to be communication. All right, thank you, Joyce. And I'll, I'll volley the next question to you. Uh, so isn't the tree of heaven a major target of the spotted lanternfly currently south of us in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia? Yes, tree of, um, tree of heaven, Ilanthus altissima, is the favorite um, source for spotted lanternfly, which is not a fly and it is not a lantern, it is spotted. <laughs> spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper which goes through four instars before the final stage. And what it is, is it, um, it inserts a mouth part into the um, xylem phloem of the trees and it takes the nutrition as it's coming back down after photosynthesis and it robs the plant of that. It then exudes the sugars that it doesn't wanna use and causes icky sooty mold mildew. Tree of Heaven is its favorite, especially the young tree of heaven. Scientifically, it's been proven that spotted lanternfly can survive without tree of heaven. Um, there are many other things that they can feed on. It is in New York. It is in several counties in the lower area of New York, as well as Ithaca, as well as a couple of other places. If you write down uh, Julie, N-Y-S-I-P-M-S-L-F, I'll include that in resources. Um, so we are trying to tell people, don't transport it. it egg masses can be on anything that's metal. Um, scout, if you see Ilanthus where you live, learn about spotted lanternfly, learn what to look for when, report it to IMAP invasives. In New York, the real worry is our vineyards and all our tourism and all of our visitors that come in from south of us that might now be bringing it with them. Yeah, we'll have to keep an eye open for that one. That was a long um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have a series of questions that came in while you were talking about the stump cutting issues. So let me lob these at you in a quick series here. So first, um, someone read that cutting and spraying Ilanth the stumps will cause the plant to send out shoots. Is that true? And the info said that you need to cut a slit in the trunk and spray there. So the PSU Penn State University Tree of Heaven is gonna go into really good details because yes, with Ilanthus, if you do a cut stump, you are probably going to cause more root sprouts. With Ilanthus, they call, they call it cut and squirt. And I've not done this successfully. I did find an Ilanthus to my horror on my, on my property. And basically you're, you're doing um, deep gashes in the, um, the cambium 
and then you're spraying the systemic herbicide so it goes down. So you're kind of sneaking up on it. Um, if you cut that tree, it will root sprout, absolutely. And I didn't okay. go into details because it was trying to hurry. <laughs> and I think the next question is kind of along the same lines. It came in at the same time. And this is just asking about um, the value of full cut and spray versus hack and squirt, which I think is what you just talked about, right? The hack and squirt is, is what would be utilized with Ilanthus altissima, the cut and spray. And that's where consult a professional. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a professional certified applicator. We all should know when we say, I would like you to do this for me. Mm -hmm. So is it species dependent then if you choose the full cut and spray versus the hack and squirt method? It is the, it is the behavioral manner of how it, how it grows. So okay. um, the, the angelica, um, uh, the, the, those that, that really grow by root sprout is where we'd use the hack and squirt rather than those that primarily um, spread by seed. Okay, that makes sense. And the, la the third stump question <laughs> is, can we use the stump treatment method later in the autumn? And it basically just saying before the plant starts to regrow in the spring. You want to do it before the plant goes dormant. So if you okay. waited until, okay, in, in, in late summer, there's less growth and there's more going to nutrition. In what we know as, as, as autumn, um, the leaf goes through um, abscission and then a uh, senescence and then abscission. Senescence is where it takes all of the nutrients it needs from the leaf, which is taking out the green, which is why it turns color and it brings it to the roots. And then abscission is when the leaves go off. If you wait much longer after that, the roots, the trees no longer actively bringing nutrients down. So you've missed your window. So that's why we say late summer through, through autumn. No, okay. I wouldn't do it now. They're dormant. And I think that answers another question as well, which says, does the cut stump technique also work in the spring, but not as well or not at all? It, it, it works. I use, you know, but you're going to be cutting, you're going to be killing the leaves. Right. Okay. Well, you already did it because you cut it. It's not going it, to, it's not going to be as effective. All right. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, good to see that there's so many questions about this. Uh, seems to be a hot topic. I like it. Um, so the next question is uh, kind of asking you to discuss something. It's just dis discuss Bishop's Weed Agapodium. How do we get it gone? Um, read, go, go to Prism Species Information, putting in Bishop's Weed. Um, it's difficult. I had um, one person had it under an ornamental tree, a tree they wanted. It was a weeping cherry or something. And we agreed that it was set up such that she mowed close to it. So she put down a water permeable um, weed cloth that was not going to harm the tree, but was going to starve the herbaceous perennials leaves. And since she mows around it, it's going to keep it from escaping. I've not heard if that was successful or not, but that's how we, we figured it out. So, you know, if it's on the side of the road in the woods, that's a different matter because if you really tried to pull it out and rake it out, now you have all the seed bank that you're dealing with. But if it's in your managed landscape, be firm. <laughs> all right, now here's a question about Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, you mentioned that at Cornell Cooperative Extension, you train people to ID invasives. Can you provide more details about that and can anyone volunteer? So we as CC have delivered a lot of education. I have under the auspices of the Lower Hudson Prism for the last several years, where because they're a DEC funded, EPF funded entity and our role is education, we've done a lot of um, to the public, create citizen scientists who are helping map invasives into New York IMAP invasives database, who are scouting particular places and so we've provided a lot of education that's open to the public and is free and is for you to volunteer. Um, in, the, in the extension system, the Master Gardener volunteers are educated in a lot of different um, aspects of horticulture. They often um, pick areas that they're especially good at. And we have training every few years and there is an expectation of giving time back to our specific programs as part of that volunteer um, entity. 
Okay. And as a follow up to that, I know that um, Brian is working on being trained to do IMAP invasive training. So, spoil alert, you might hear more from DLC in the future about doing um, that type of invasives ID yeah. and being, being trained in there's it. There's great training. There's some great videos on the PRISM. There's some great vi videos on DEC's site. And DEC also um, hosts really good, um, really good education. The cat just went into the bag that was on the chair and now fell over. So the cat's in, the cat's out of the bag actually. <laughs> I was waiting for that, thank you. He did it so I didn't have to. <laughs> Yeah, it's excellent. And so IMAP Invasives also has a lot of great resources on their web pages that I've been looking at and hope to host a training on the IMAP Invasives program soon. Okay. Uh, and speaking of invasives, uh, the next question is, how can I get rid of crown vetch? I don't know. I know that it was introduced um, as a wonderful thing to, to manage roadsides, and it got away from us. Um, it used to be planted specifically to not have to mow. Um, I, I, I don't know. I haven't been asked that, and I'd have to look it up. I would look up crown veg botanical name, and then I would look up by botanical name control, and I would probably say site colon dot edu, which would put me to educational sites, or I'd say site colon dot org, and I'd start reading. If I put in crown vetch control, I would, without anything else, I probably would get a lot of hits for people trying to sell me product. So we try to learn more about it and that trick of asking the scientific name. And I don't know how it's rated in New York, so I don't know what tier it's in, so I don't know if it's on the PRISM site. That was a multiple, I don't know. All right, and the next question is, any suggestions on what to overplant after removing stilt grass? Stilt grass um, likes edge of forest. It likes a shade, dappled shade. Um, um, a regular old grass, um, a wildflower mix that's suitable to our area. Um, it likes disturbed soil, so you could probably be fairly successful with just hand sewing something, do get something that's suitable to our area. Um, there's, there's, that just called County Soil and Water sells some seed mixes, but I would, I would try, you know, it's, it's where it's spread by seed in a sort of sunny edge. So I would try a wildflower seed mix or, or grass, lawn grass. The answer is always natives, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> Invasives are usually evil. Natives aren't always angels. And in between isn't horrible. So <laughs> we like to have natives, but it's not a panacea. Balance. Good point, good point. Uh, next question, what about zebra grass? Invasive or not invasive? I don't know zebra grass. I know zoya grass. Hmm. Maybe it was a typo. Uh, zoya grass is something that isn't doesn't grow well here because it's a hot loving grass and it goes no it's cooler loving and it goes dormant I don't remember I've okay. looked up zoya grass and if anyone wants they can email me at cornell jdt225 at cornell.edu and I'll look it up again I don't remember thank you and we've got another question about Ilanthus here. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they're asking. It says, there is so much tree of heaven along the roads for miles. How to deal with authorities? So I, th I think they might be asking if the trees are growing in the road right of way, who's, is there anyone whose responsibility it would be to manage that? I, so depending upon the, uh, depending upon the road, uh, the Taconic, is part of New York State roads. Route nine is a county road. So depending upon the classification of the road, there are entities who are responsible for it. But given that in New York, the focus on keeping out spotted lanternfly is New York DEC and New York Ag and Markets, the 
current focus, sadly, because of the new pest, I think is really raising awareness and is really going to, by necessity, change the behaviors on how our road crews manage areas that obviously have islands. All right. Uh, someone is asking you to just kind of repeat some information that was uh, already said. So can you please repeat what else besides perennial ryegrass uh, to use to smother Japanese silk grass? Okay. So Japanese silk grass, as I said, um, goes by seed and um, and likes uh, disturbed areas. And so I'm, I do this research too, but I, it worked in my area. So where mine was growing underneath the edge of the oak tree, when I mow, if I catch the grass, I just dump the grass on the silk grass and it smothers it because it, it, it smothers it. I mean, you could do it with other mulch, I'm cheap. You know, you could dump a, a lot of last year's leaves on it so you can smother it that way. I got in trouble because I used the tractor to go a little bit further in when there was seed on the um, on the stilt grass, and then I mowed my regular lawn. Okay, and so I established stilt grass in the lawn. But what I did this fall was I, I strengthened the lawn, which grows a little bit higher, I mow it at three inches, and it kind of shades out the silk grass. So if you strengthen your lawn with a mixture that's suitable to your area, the trick with perennial ryegrass is it, um, it um, um, germinates in autumn in five days and comes in really, really strong in spring. So if you look up Cornell turf rejuvenating your lawn, that's what I did to make my lawn stronger than the stilt grass. That sounds like good advice for making your lawn stronger than stilt grass. <laughs> so, um, so we've got one person who typed in an answer to a previous question, which is to explain that zebra grass is a variety of miscanthus. So oh. that that is new to me. Okay, well, if it's a, if it's a miscanthus, I believe that the DEC prohibited and regulated has very specific um, genus miscanthus species listed, and I'd need to look up. I'm guessing it may not be prevalent enough in our area of New York mm -hmm. that it's on the list. But as I said, I do know that the list was being reviewed and is in the process of being updated. Okay. That's good to know. And the next question is about IMAP invasives. Um, so when invasives are reported on IMAP invasive, what happens then? So for example, with Tree of Heaven, what happens to that data that's being collected? Okay, um, I'm gonna answer two things. If you use iNaturalist, that also gets bulk uploaded into IMAP invasives uh, at, at, at time. But IMAP invasives is used to educate people who need to understand the, the, the scope and spread of specific plants. And does IMAP invasives do diseases or, or bugs, insects? I don't remember, but I'll use plants because that's what we're talking tonight. When we map things, like we map jumping worms, so there's an animal that it maps. When you map something, you, you take a picture with your phone and you, you click where you got it and it GPSs and you say, this is what I saw, this is where I was, send. That triggers experts behind the scenes to verify your photo and, and confirm you saw what you saw. And then any person can get on IMAP invasives and start putting in filters and you can see zooming in all of North America, your county, you can see what's been reported and where and in what abundance. So it shows us growth and spread. It shows us the occurrence of new species that we're watching for. And it's citizen science um, advising professionals and ag and markets and DEC what's going on where they can't be out there like we can. They can't be out there searching every day. They're doing the rest of their jobs. So it's a really powerful tool. And in the last five years, it's gotten very fast 
it used to be when Jennifer tried to display it, we just crashed the system at CCE. I mean, the phone system was nothing. We'd all go poke and it go, and now it's really good. So it's, it's, it's good technology and it's absolutely valuable to the researchers and the scientists. Pretty easy to use too. I'm kind of beginning a learning journey with it and it, 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 it's pretty easy to use as well. It's, I can do it with the dog in, in the leash in one hand, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of hard, to, but yeah, it's, it's very, it's gotten much more intuitive. Excellent. Excellent. And, and you can take your data and wait until you go home and then upload your records. So it's not killing your phone while you're out and about. Yep. Uh, next question, I believe we'll have a variable answer, but uh, please comment on the use of forestry mulchers as a means of controlling invasives. So I think that, that by forestry mulchers, I'm imagining a, a large like walk behind excavator. I don't, I don't know the approach. I would wonder how much um, the soil is disturbed that you're triggering seed banks. If what you're doing is, um, maybe it's like a bush hog. Maybe it's something where you're whacking down things and leaving them as you go. That's okay if you're making sure you're monitoring and you know what might re-sprout. If it's something that's grinding things up and leaving bark shreds, then I'm gonna start getting worried about um, Asian jumping worms. And I can't get into that tonight, but the high, carbon shredded mulch, bark mulch is a, um, a, a food source that is really preferred by those jumping worms. Um, and so I would want to talk more about what that process is and where it is and what consequences should be monitored. Okay, now here's a question about Russian olive. Is it too late to apply an herbicide to Russian olive that was cut down last fall? Yeah, um, I think that by now the plant has formed a barrier that it's not gonna be taking it in. And really monitor because I, I got a call from someone just two days ago. Um, Russian olive is one of the ones that when you mow it, it really stimulates the, the growth. Thank you. Um, so the next, we have a comment followed by a question. So you mentioned native fox grape, and I've never heard of it. However, this individual is watching another webinar in which they said not to cut grapevines because they can become a good source of food for wildlife. They can be. So fox grape is the native, and the cultivar that we know as Concord is the cultivar that is Concord grape. So Concord, Concord grapes are native. Fox grape is the general name and I, it's Vitus something. I don't have that in my head. Absolutely. I love native grapes. Um, it's when they're somewhere they shouldn't ought to be. So I had an area where I have a nice uh, crab apple tree and I got behind on things. I have a new knee. And when I went up there, there was a really well-established wild grape and it's killing the tree. So I will leave it other places, but in that part of my landscape, I really don't want to have that grapevine crawling all over my ornamental area. In terms of food for wildlife, it's fantastic. Um, where we walk after one of the good winds, um, some of the crab apples on the road had fallen down as well as some grapes, and so my dog could have a snack. Um, now, here's a question about a couple of trees. Are Angelica tree and tree of heaven related? I've been watching what I thought was tree of heaven in a local park, and now I may, I believe it may be Angelica tree. I don't know that they're related. I would have to look up the genus. I think they are not. Um, Japanese Angelica, I ran across a picture. Um, if you can imagine where I showed that, um, that compound, um, that compound compound leaf, where there were lots of leaflets around lack of leaves. Lot, lots of leaflets on Japanese angelica at every intersection of the leaflets in the stem is a thorn. It's just amazing. It's tiny. It could be, it could be a needle. It could be a sewing needle. Um, I also, there is a native plant called nicknamed devil's walking stick. 
And I think it and Japanese Angelica also have similarly bumpy, um, thorny bark. I would need to look at the mm -hmm. both of them, but um, Ilanthus altissima, tree of heaven is gonna have that smooth bark that's described as looking like the skin of a muskmelon cantaloupe. And the Japanese Angelica is gonna have the thorns. Yeah, and tree of heaven will stink. If you scratch any part of the bark, it stinks. It smells like burnt peanut butter. So that's an easy way to know if you've got a tree of heaven. Is and if you try and nose. squish the leaves on Angelica, you'll get you'll get. Burnt. If you want to do either of those things. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so we have uh, kind of a uh someone submitted two things i'm going to combine them what do you think about bugle weed and can you use it to control other weeds so bugle weed is one of the things that when it escapes your ornamental garden and gets into your lawn is sort of right plant wrong place and i've got bugle weed all over the front of my lawn i just look the other way um what was the second half of the question can you use it to uh mitigate other weeds you can use it as a ground cover, absolutely. You need to know where it is and you need to make sure it stays where it wants to be, but it's a good ground cover. Um, it attracts a lot of bumblebees, um, attracts a lot of things, but when it goes where it shouldn't ought to, it's really hard to get out because it spreads with those, with those stones. All right, we have just a couple questions left. And the first one, I'm not sure what plant this is. It's asking the best way to get rid of Chameleon, C H A M E L I O N. I'm not sure what plant that is. Say it again. C H C H A M E L I O N. I don't know it. I don't either. Sorry. I'm not sure if it's a, if it's a typo or if it's a plant that we're just not familiar with. I just I just don't so, know it. Sorry. Yeah. If you're still on and you want to type in um, some clarification, please do. But I'm, I don't think we can answer that right now. All right, well, so we have just one final question left. Uh, so I've raked out, pulled out, smothered out Japanese stilt grass in the edge of woodland in an effort to keep the march uh, of this invasive. This is more of a uh, epic than a, <laughs> than a question. I, I, feel, I feel the pain already. <laughs> yeah. However, I can only manage it in that area. What can be done to keep it out, of, out or replace it with something else or leave it and hope for natives to regenerate in this area on their own? They're not going to regenerate on their own. The amount of seeds that Japanese silk grass creates and the fact that the deer don't eat it are going to give that a five-year cycle with those seeds that are, that are living, and it's going to just keep creeping up from where it is. So um, keeping it from going to seed, you know, smothering it, um, trying to get other things established there once you've smothered it. Um, again, if you, if you, keep mowing it too short, it's just going to go to seed really short too. So it's almost better to let it go bigger if you can, and then get it out of there just as it, as you watch and it's going to seed, but it's, it, it is going to prevail. How's that for a positive note? <laughs> and on a high note, well, yeah. um, uh, the person who was mentioning chameleon entered it, the chameleon plant entered chameleon plant uh, Julie, you want to take this? You're better at pronouncing, uh, pronouncing the Latin than I am. Yikes, I've never oh. heard this one either. Hotunia cordata? Yeah, I know it now. Okay. I know it now. Chameleon plant. It, um, it's a wonderful ground cover that has different colored leaves and it spreads by rhizome and it's very difficult to get rid of. It's, it's, it's like mugwort, only it's short and it's prettier. Um, so see if it's on the prism database i don't think so i don't know that i've seen it there um and and put in that that botanical name and put in control and put in .org or .edu or .gov and see how it spreads I, i'm quite sure it's by rhizome and um you need to be persistent well you uh might have the record now you answered 28 questions and <laughs> 20, 25 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. So great job, Joyce. Thank you. I was trying not to go too quickly to, through the material, but it's so hard to take something this big and try and make it. So that's why I decided 
know what your plant is, figure out what, what, what methods you have, figure out what your goals are, um, mark things on what you're supposed to do when and where, and don't get discouraged. We didn't mm -hmm. get this all here in a few generations and we're not gonna get rid of it all in a few generations, yeah. but we can make a difference. Point. It's a good strategy, not just for managing in basis, but life in general. Yeah. Med meditative. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I, I apologize for the cats. They do know how to open. Them. It's, you know, it's always fun to have a wildlife cameo in any presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was much appreciated. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Joyce, and thank you all for attending. Those of you who are still on, we appreciate your persistence. And you know, this video has been recorded and we'll be sending out a link to the recording as well as to the resources that Joyce has mentioned um, during the evening. So thank you all so much and have a lovely evening. Thank you guys. Good night, everyone.